Good evening, everyone who's here in the room with us, everyone who's joining us online. I'm Emily Jones. I'm an associate professor here at the Blavatnik School. Um, I'm delighted to introduce this evening's topic and our speaker and our two discussants. Um, so as you know, we're discussing today transnational advocacy in a digital era and really thinking away about the ways in which digitalization has changed advocacy. Um, so one of the figures for us all is that uh, if we think about movements like Move On, Get Up, Compact, they're using digital analytics to really figure out what the issues are that are salient and then how to mobilize around them. They operate in over 20 countries from South Africa to Sweden, from Poland to New Zealand. And they claim to have over 17 million members worldwide. I think many of us have interact, interfaced with them. Many of us have engaged um, and been part of those advocacy movements. Um, Nina Hall, former colleague here at Oxford and a good friend, is now Assistant Professor of International Relations at John Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies, SAIS, has written a book on this topic. Um, so Nina, welcome. Welcome back to Oxford, because you did your DPhil here a while back. Um, it's lovely to have you here again. So Nina's going to spend about 20 minutes um, explaining what her research has shown. Um, and then we have two fantastic discussants who both joined us as MPP students recently. And of course, when you put out a call to MPP students, anyone got any experience in this? Um, area, of course, you get a lot of um, brilliant uh, people coming forward. So thank you both for joining us. We have Luisa fernandez Zara, who's a Colombian um, free speech attorney, research activist, um, and you've defended and promoted freedom of expression in your country from many angles, working with a not-for-profit recently, um, that has done a lot of work behind the scenes on the analytics side, supporting um, civil society organizations across Latin America. Because um, I think, as you've said in your um, email to me, a lot of the big media companies that, uh, that are very adept at using these analytic skills, and actually a lot of the civil society organizations are nowhere near as adept, so your organization has been trying to support them um, to improve their digital skills. Um, and Rehan Asad, who's now also on the MPP, is internationally recognized human rights lawyer and advocate, um, who's teaching at human rights law at uh, Yale recently. Um, and of Uyghur origin, and you've spoken out a lot about the situation. Um, in China. Um, so delighted to have you with us as well to think about how digitalization is changing advocacy and the type of work that you've been doing as well. So thank you very much. So we'll give you the floor, Nina, for about 20 minutes and then we'll open up. Um, and we're gonna have an interactive discussion afterwards. So if you're online, I'm here with, I can see any um, questions you post. Um, so please do post questions in the chat. And if you're here in the room, um, we'll be coming around for your questions. Um, so we'd love to hear from all of you in the room if you've got experience in this space as well. So please. Um, do feel free to share. Nina, the floor is yours. Thanks so much for the introduction. It's a real pleasure to be back here. Um, as Emily mentioned, I, I did my DPhil at Oxford in international relations. And I last time I think I was presenting here was the last book I wrote. So it feels nice to be able to come back um, and also, of course, be here in person. Um, so the book is, um, as Emily has mentioned, it's about transnational advocacy in the digital era. But I want to be very clear that it's not about only what happens online. The reason I say that is often people are like, oh, so you study social media, you know, do you think it's all slacktivism, it's all clicktivism? The point of this presentation and the whole book is to focus on the way that formal political organizations, in this case, groups like Move On or Camp Act or 38 Degrees, use the internet to mobilize people both online and offline. And I challenge this distinction that you either see advocacy actors engaged online or just offline, right? I think that's not very useful. All the groups that I study happen to have been born in the digital era. And so they have particular things that they're very good at, like digital analytics. But even older NGOs, the Oxfam, Green Pieces of the World, obviously operating online. So to give you a bit of a sense of the groups that I study and the kinds of political debates that they are shaping, um, here's a sample. Uh, in Germany, there was big protests around and against uh, the transatlantic trade and intellectual property agreement. Um, this was an EU-US trade agreement. Um, and in 2015, where I was actually working at Hertie at the time, um, I was, saw this massive protest of roughly a quarter of a million people outside the Brandenburg Gate. Um, and then you can see people filing up to the tear gap. And this is one of the biggest protests since the Iraq War. 
The founder of Campact, or one of the co-founders, is the person in red with the microphone. He was speaking at one of these events. Campact is a German digital advocacy organization. I'll introduce you to them all throughout the talk. But the point I want you to take away here is this group, which was founded in the internet era, was one of the key actors. Not the only. There were multiple uh, unions, other NGOs, mobilizing public opinion and trying to push against the EU uh, US trade agreement and the Canadian one. And Campact was widely acknowledged also by conservative commentators um, and the Social Democrat members themselves, uh, as I note in the book, as being a powerful force mobilizing public opinion. And my, I come from New Zealand, my own home action station, the New Zealand variant was also contributing to the protests against the Transatlantic, uh, sorry, the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement. And on a very different issue, just to give you a sense of the broad scope and in a very different country in Poland, a Polish digital advocacy organization called Aksha Demokrasia mobilized people to defend the rights of judges to stay till the end of their term. Interestingly, this was quite a technical debate initially and didn't mobilize lots of people, but they saw a real uh, need to focus on this issue. So I want you to keep that in mind as we go through the presentation, because what I'm talking about might seem abstract, it might seem like it's just occurring on social media, but I'm talking about the ways that these organizations mobilize people online and offline. And what's important is that um, in international relations, the, the discipline that I, is my closest home, um, there hasn't really been much written about these, despite the fact that they are at times mobilizing people on important international issues like trade, refugees, and climate. Rather, uh, what I discovered when I started this work, and I should admit, I didn't know any of these organizations, you know, five odd years ago, they were new to me. Um, I discovered that there was quite a rich literature in political communication. Scholars like David Karp have written the book, The Move On Effect, where he argues that Move On had an un, uh, a real impact, in fact, transformed American political advocacy. How did they do this? They did this through capturing people's emails when you signed up to an online petition and then using them for subsequent campaigns. This seems obvious to us now, right? But this was seeing the email address of somebody as a resource that you could then ask and fundraise for your organization and then also use for subsequent campaigns. So just because you sign a campaign to save uh, a local library, you might also be interested in you know, fighting against the Iraq war or mobilizing for climate action. Now, in his second book, the 2016 one, Dave Cup elaborated this and showed how Move On was doing amazing things with analytic activism. So many of us are familiar with the way sort of Netflix or Amazon gives us books based on what we've clicked in the past. Similarly, these organizations use analytics to understand what campaigns we're most likely to be interested in. They can do things like run A-B testing. It's very simple. It's not really so much analytics. Sending this half of the group an email saying, save the climate to save the penguins. This half, save the climate to save your children. The penguins are more popular. We send that to the entire list of over a million people. Now, the point I'm trying to make is that this was a novel type of advocacy, right? They were fast and rapid, and they're able to do this, and it's been well documented in the US. However, no one has drawn the dots for what this means at the international or the transnational level. And importantly, CARP's work was really about move on in the US, yet there are other over 20 organizations worldwide. Yet all the political communication scholarship tends to focus on these organizations within their own national context. Now, in a way, that's no criticism of them. They're doing the job they should be. But my job I saw was to try and connect the dots because it's a global phenomenon. Digital advocacy organizations that follow a model very like Move On exist in over 19 countries worldwide. On six continents, they claim over 20 million members, and we can talk about what that means, or one in 15 domestic voters. And many IR scholars have called for theories of advocacy in the internet era. In fact, the entire discipline of transnational advocacy in IR can go back to Kip and Sickink's work. And in their work, they really pinpointed the role of technology at enabling and mobilizing people um, across borders. So that's why we might see more transnational advocacy, right? In the late 90s, early 2000s, these arguments about a global civil society based often on a sort of techno-optimism. And I should highlight it was often seen as progressive. And we can come back to that point, right? Global civil society was going to be progressive. We were going to see national borders disappear and progressive global civil society emerge. So the book asks two questions. 
to what extent do digital advocacy organizations, this is the term I use, I admit it's a little clumsy, it's hard to sort of exactly uh, define who they are, but the term that's most useful I found is digital advocacy organizations like Move On and Campact. How do they, to what extent do they challenge IR theories of advocacy? And how do they campaign transnationally? I'll focus more on the first half, uh, in, on the first point um, in today's presentation. So what I did is I spent over five years observing staff. These, all of these organizations have permanent headquarters and staff campaigners who are paid and work. And I watched, they have also formed an international network and I participated in over a dozen or half a dozen of their summits. These summits brought activists face to face. This is important, although they operate online, you know, digital advocacy organizations, they really needed to come face to face. And I would spend, you know, a week at a time talking with them as they were trying to develop campaigns on trade or how to counter uh, what they saw as the threat of the far right. Um, I conducted over 100 interviews. Some of these were multiple interviews, say, with the founders of the organizations. And then I will refer to also to this data set of campaign actions that I collected from their websites. And the key argument of the book is that digital advocacy organizations are quite distinct from NGOs like Greenpeace and Oxfam and from the way IR has thought about advocacy in the past. This is because they get their power from mobilizing people very rapidly based on analytics, rather from what I argue most NGOs develop some sort of long-term commitment to cause and develop some sort of expertise. And I'll talk you through that. The second part focuses more on the transnational dimension. And here I argue that we do see the formation of a transnational network. And what's interesting is that network has diffused the same type or form of organization. So rather than being a network united around an issue like climate or refugees or human rights, it's diffused an organizational model in countries as different as Israel and South Africa. And these groups have come together to campaign on transnational issues, but that they target the nation state not international organizations. So first of all, I want to give you a bit more depth of the model. I argue in the book that there are four ways that these digital advocacy organizations challenge our conventional understanding and IR of advocacy. The first is that most of the organizations in my study engage actively in elections. What I mean by that is they try and oust conservative candidates and push for progressives. Now, scholarship like this recent piece by Schmitz and Mitchell has pointed out NGOs are charities. It's often very difficult for them, in fact, almost impossible, to engage proactively in election campaigning. They need to be impartial so that they can, you know, push for their causes, whoever gets elected. And their charity status also means that they can't get um, tax-free uh, donations if they were to be too political in many countries. The organizations that I study, however, see elections as an important moment to push for change. They talk about electoral bite because that's the moment when they can hold uh, members of parliament or potential members of parliament to account. And they do that by fundraising, traditional things like canvassing, as you can see these uh, volunteers in their orange t-shirts going around knocking on doors, but use digital tech to do that as well, to figure out which streets they should be focusing on. Um, who they should be ringing, what kind of scripts, what kind of messaging are going to work. In Australia, GetUp has been um, very successful in, in, this was one uh, occasion in the election uh, a few years back where Tony Abbott, a former prime minister, lost his seat and GetUp was one of the reasons that he lost his seat because they were very effective in that particular constituency. So that's one factor. They engage in elections and they do that because they're trying to hold a uh, members of parliament to account. These three factors sit together and I distinguish them analytically, but they all sort of reinforce and are enabled by digital technology. The first is probably not that surprising, their rapid response, right? This is kind of what the internet enables us all to do, rightly or wrongly, you can argue. Um, the organizations that I study can set up a campaign within a few hours. So when I went to visit Ulstan in Austria, one of a uh, digital advocacy organization based there, I'd been spending time with them for a whole week and I came in one morning and they were launching a new campaign around Syria, solidarity with Syria. And they hadn't been working on that the day before and they sent it out to their members within hours, right? Online petitions are fast. Now, this is also because they're multi-issue generalists. 
all the organizations have an incredibly broad span of issues they work on. So 38 degrees, and I have data on this in the book, might focus on anything from saving libraries, saving the bees, helping refugees, LGBT issues, trade politics, digital governance. It's an extremely broad area. And this contrasts with most NGOs. Well, they might not be single issue. They do have a relatively specific bandwidth, right? Greenpeace, climate change, environmental issues, right? Oxfam, poverty and development. And part of this model is based on the fact that they want to respond to what their members think is most important. They're very member driven. And when I say member driven, members fund the organization. So they're all over 80 or 90% um, funded by, by their members, often through sort of crowd funding. Um, they take, the members take the actions. They share things on Facebook. They sign the online petitions. They mobilize on the streets, like what we saw in that first slide. And this is different from when we think about what I would argue sort of more traditional NGOs like Oxfam. Oxfam can plan out its campaigns, right? Can say at the beginning of the year, we need at Davos, at the beginning of the year, we need our poverty um, and, and world inequalities report. We know that the UNFCCC is going to be a big summit this year and we need to focus on this. They can plan out their reports. These groups are fast and rapid. And what I argue in the book is that what this enables them to do is to sort of harness digitally network power. They can seize a moment when they see there's increased salience around something. And in the book, I go into depth about the refugee crisis in September 2015. This is uh, an example where suddenly there was huge attention to the number of refugees and asylum seekers coming into Europe, 38 degrees, the British Digital Advocacy Organization, which wasn't working on refugee rights. They weren't a refugee organization, recognized how big this issue was coming. And in fact, uh, the lead campaigner, who was the discussant just two nights ago at UCL, was, was on the panel with me, reminded us of how she got up in the morning, saw the frontline news around Aylan Kurdi, a young toddler who'd washed up on the beach of Turkey, um, Syrian. And she called up her colleagues and said, 7 a.m. in the morning, we we're all having a meeting. This is the moment we need to seize it. This is when people are going to care the most about refugees because she could see that it was a very, 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 um, there was high uh, attention to it. And so they became part of a broader movement to increase the refugee quota in the UK and to welcome refugees. Now, again, they weren't the only organization. I'm not attributing the change um, when David Cameron did agree to welcome more refugees to them. My point is that they were part and they were very rapid to respond. But the rapid response also has a flip side. So because they could quickly pick up new issues, they also drop issues once they lose interest. And what I saw with 38 Degrees, and I, and I followed this campaign, was they did campaign on refugee rights for a few weeks, but then it dropped down the interest of their members and other issues came up. And the bees, interestingly, is an issue that people really care about. And, you know, it is an important issue to, to save bees. We need pollinators. Um, and it also brings in a significant amount of funding for these organizations. So if you're reacting to members' preferences, if you're listening to what they're saying and you're not trying to transform those very preferences, you drop your refugee campaigns and you campaign on bees. And to me, this was really interesting that there was, you know, there's a strength to model, a weakness. And as I got to know the organizations and talked to them more about their campaigns, I recognized they were aware of this tension. Particularly um, in 2016, 2017, Brexit, Trump, they started to become aware of how the model that they had created, this rapid response, multi-issue member driven, perhaps wasn't dealing with the really hard issues, the issues that were minority rights. And so some of the organizations in the network that I studied evolved the model, not all of them, but some of them saw a need to try and make the campaigns they ran more value driven, and staff take more of a stewardship role in trying to transform members' preferences. And so the counter example I give in the book to the UK 38 degrees case is Get Up, an Australian organization, very similar. The top two photos uh, were from September 2015. They mobilized people around Light the Tart, got them out to rally, to rallies, to push the Australian government to take in more refugees. And Similarly, they were part of a broad movement. They did win some concessions from the Conservative government in Australia. But what's interesting is that they continued to campaign on refugee rights, right? They had a long-term strategic goal that they wanted to get all asylum seekers out of Manus and Nauru, 
which are two offshore detention uh, sites in, in Australia. So GetUp had made that decision, the staff had made it, and they looked, even if members weren't majoritarian or behind it, they looked for ways to try and transform the preferences. So part of the book is trying to understand the ways that these organizations have made decisions to try and shift away from a rapid reactive response model. Now, I just want to take the last five minutes to reflect on the transnational dimension, because what I've described right now is an organizational model that's spread globally and its strengths and its weaknesses and how it's distinct from NGOs that came in the pre-digital era. So in the book, I point out for those of you in the IR world that this transnational advocacy network, which is called OPEN, so it includes all of the digital advocacy organizations I've named so far, Camp Act, 38 Degrees, Move On, Get Up. There's one organization per country, so there's never more than, more than one. And interestingly, they're united not around a common issue, single issue like human rights, but around this model. They all do share progressive values, and we can talk about what are progressive values, because obviously that's, that is and has been contested. Um, and so they identify as a global sisterhood of national grassroots campaigning organizations. And I should say, in promoting this model, they have done things like looked at for ways to support, say, a new organization in France when does, one doesn't exist. So they've actively propagated the model, as well as supporting activists who want to emulate it. And the book compares both of that, the active uh, hunt for people to start up organizations, which happened in Israel, it happened um, also in France, and also support for groups, say the New Zealand group went and got assistance from the Australian or the Polish group, um, also learned from their German counterparts. But to give you some of the dimensions of their transnational collaborations, they collaborated on tactics, they collaborated on uh, tech, technology, I also ask the question though, to what extent do they campaign on transnational issues and when do they, or how frequently do they target international institutions? And what I find is that a number of their campaigns are on domestic issues, things like libraries um, or health or social welfare, but a big chunk of their campaigns are on transnational issues, roughly 40%. Um, the UK, uh, 38 degrees and Brexit is in there as its own category, obviously it's a bit complicated to code in either of those two. To give you an example, um, this is Camp Act in Germany, uh, which was what you saw at the beginning of the trade protests. They were very actively uh, trying to also campaign on Mercosur, so stop Mercosur, save the Amazon, um, and inviting people to sign up to this petition. So that's an example of a campaign action that would have been coded in this previous slide as a transnational issue. Then I also, with that same data set, um, and this is here split out by the four organizations I chose, looked at how frequently they focused on an international target. So this could be the World Bank, the World Trade Organization, the WHO, or another international you know, uh, decision maker. And as you can see, they're overwhelmingly focused on domestic targets. Almost all of their campaigns, even if they're focused on, say, something like trade, target the national level. In fact, 97%, that's from the previous slide of campaign actions, mobilized citizens to put pressure on national decision makers. This is their theory of change, that they want to mobilize citizens of a country to put pressure on the democratically elected decision makers who should be accountable back to those citizens. That's how they see um, their, their strategic um, power. And Ben Brenzel, who founded the Open Network, described this as power optimized for domestic influence, yet networked for global scale. So he, he was the one who built this network called Open, and he had a very explicit aim behind that, which was to try and get change, progressive change, on global issues. But he saw the most value coming if you had national uh, organizations. But that doesn't mean that there isn't a transnational dimension. And the book, in one of the chapters, uh, looks at the ways that you can essentially optimize um, global um, uh, domestic power, but try and network it globally. And I, um, I refer to this concept, which is not my term, but others have used it as well, of digitally distributed actions. The idea here is that you campaign on something at the same time, the same issue, so in this case, climate change, but you have a national target. 
rather than the same international target. So a good example here is the climate movement. Classic, you know, the People's Climate Marches, which were started uh, originally 350.org was really important to them, Avaaz and many of the organizations uh, I study help mobilize people around the world. And so you could be here in Oxford, you could be in Wellington or Pretoria or in a small town anywhere in the world, but connected to a global movement. You'd be taking action on the same day and these sort of event maps, which for any of you who've gone on to the Fridays for Future and Youth Climate Strikes will be familiar with. And the point here that I'm trying to make is that they are, there are features that are transnationalized, but not necessarily everyone is looking to target an international institution. And the reason I'm trying to make this point is that some of the literature has suggested that as authority shifts to the international level, we would expect to see more of the contestation happening at the international level. And in fact, a lot of the scholarship on climate advocacy, at least in IR, has focused on advocacy targeting the UNFCCC. And so my point here is that you're missing out on a whole lot of other elements of transnational advocacy by not focusing on these types of protest. So in conclusion, I want you to take away, at least from this talk, that formal political organizations matter. The decisions made within campaigning groups matter even in the digital era. We shouldn't see the digital era as all about grassroots organizing and that you know anyone anywhere can connect and individuals just like randomly create social movements. In my view, we have to look at formal organizations and in my case, this is digital advocacy organizations and they have a very distinct model, member-driven rapid response, multi-issue and their power is from mobilizing not expertise. They're networked around a common model and they've promoted the spread of this globally and they campaign on transnational issues but target transnational actors. I'll leave it at that. Um, I guess we can turn this off. And thanks all for your attention. I look forward to your questions and comments. Brilliant, thank you, Nina. We've already got one uh, interesting question online. So right. um, keep, if you're online, do um, put them in, put, type your questions in because we'll come to them. Um, but let, come, let's come to you, Louisa, first. Your thoughts and reflections on Nina's book and from your own experiences. Oh, well, thank you, Professor Jones and Professor Hall and everybody. Uh, well, as you said before, I am a free speech activist, but the reason why I'm here is because I, am, I have been a researcher of social media also. And right before coming, I was working at a Colombian organization called Linterna Verde that uh, is very interested in understanding how public opinion is built on social media uh, through social media analysis um, in order to support the work of other organizations. So we're a second tier organization that kind of does this analytic uh, activism that you were talking about for them. Um, the organizations that we work for are a bit different than the ones that you research because these are specialized organ organizations, even though some of them may be transnational, they are um, specialized in also progressive uh, topics like women's rights, uh, LGBT, pe LGBT people's rights. Uh, but they all recognize that internet has the potential to, you know, to help them organize uh, for action. And they also want to influence decision makers. And as you said before, the rationale behind what we do, or they do, because I'm not there anymore, is that this kind of technical tools and technical knowledge is not accessible for them because they are very costly and because you need technical knowledge that is usually reserved for uh, marketing companies who, who have these tools to, to study, like deeply study social media. I'm very interested interested um, Professor Hall in understanding um, if these organizations that you were stu studying demand this kind of information and if they're getting it, like this kind of uh, technical information, because you did say that they do this, um, this kind of um, research, but I don't know how deep it is. Um, I would like to know if it's possible, Annie, I don't know if you got that deep, um, to what kind of insights they were getting from their social media analysis. And if uh, this, because you explained that they are so member driven, if they also gather information from social media to kind of like make sense of what are their members saying. And also if they are like dropping the issues that, that uh, they are working on. Brilliant. Thank you, Louisa. And if, can you, if you had one um, experience to share from your time there, 
in terms of what's worked? Because I think one of the questions, and we'll come to your thoughts on this, Nina, in a bit. One of the questions we've got online is just to say, you know, do, poli do politicians listen? Have you seen any examples in your experience there, Louisa, of, of a campaign that's worked where you've actually used digital analytics and felt like, yes, actually, it's really been helpful? So uh, we, for example, we advise an organization. This is a local organization in Colombia who advises, um, who advises victims of the armed conflict, spe specifically, mostly victims of state crimes. And uh, they did a very, very successful campaign that was luckily, uh, like it, it uh, so what happened is that they launched the campaign and they received, I think, help from the, the army in the sense that they tried to cancel it. They, they tried to censor it. Mm -hmm. So what that led to is that uh, that led to everybody being very interested in, you know, what the army was trying to censor. It started with a mural in the streets of Bogota that they painted over and everybody wanted to know what that was about. Mural, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's called, that's, uh, that's called um, very popular, popularly known as the Streisand effect, because mm -hmm. when you try to hide something, it kind of like does the opposite. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, we, what we did, so this was a strike of luck, right? Like they, they, they didn't know that the, the army was going to censor them, but they drawn that in order to develop a, like a really smart campaign online with a hashtag um, that moves like daily on social media. It's something that we never, like it's very uncommon uh, in Colombia. So like every day, this hashtag, and it has been like repurposed, repurposed for other uh, protests, uh, for other purposes. It's called, um, I, cannot, I cannot think about it right now. So um, <laughs> sorry, it's just uh, switching between English and Spanish is confusing, but. <laughs> um, uh, but the point being, that the order, who gave the order, that's the hashtag. Who gave the order was the, the, the hashtag for the, for the mural, but it also became the hashtag for who gave the order to censor the mural. Mm -hmm. So it became very successful and they have been very success, su successful in repurposing that, uh, that hashtag. And I think everybody in Colombia is aware of that campaign. Mm -hmm. Brilliant example. The lovely one to go to you, uh, Rehan, from a very different context. And we'd love to hear about your experience and how digitalization has shifted with digital advocacy is happening. Yeah. Um, and thank you so much for everybody coming, especially for our MPPs. A big shout out for you. <laughs> um, I would say that um, since Arab Spring, the internet has become such a powerful tool for global advocacy, especially digital advocacy, in terms of shining light on atrocity crimes or in terms of all sorts of um, human rights abuses. And as a result of that, countries, democracy saw internet as a powerful tool, activists in society saw it as a powerful tool to raise awareness of global issues. At the same time, authoritarian states saw that as a threat, um, threat against um, their legitimacy and as well as holding power. So we're kind of operating within that dynamics. And I'm somebody who launched advocacy on behalf of um, my beloved community, the Uyghur community who are persecuted and detained in the Chinese government's massive concentration camps from China, I saw the power of digital advocacy. For example, um, uh, obviously, like, you know, when I, when I became uh, a transition into human rights law and became an advocate, um, my comments often featured in the media, but I also used Twitter to mobilize and demand for change and ask everybody to join me and members of the Uyghur community uh, in terms of standing against tyranny and oppression. So those are the campaigns that are uh, incredibly powerful where you can use um, social media and internet and also the digital advocacy. Uh, and you mentioned uh, some of the organizations like Muwan and the sister organization like Avas. Um, Avas is one of the organizations that actually did a wonderful campaign for the Uyghurs and collected over a million signatures demanding for a response. Um, the thing about such organizations though, as, um, as you mentioned, it's, it's a, there is a rapid response. So there's a breaking news, like immediately they would respond and the signature collection is so powerful. 
but at the same time, like they move on to another cause and they just drop the cause. Um, and I, I'm not saying that others did that, but I think, uh, and but often the case that is sort of trend. So political organizations really come into picture, like Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International, that often nonprofit and civil society that has been have been advocating for these causes for years. They will continuously in that long term commitment to advocate. For myself, for example. Um, I, I always, um, and I read this uh, from Harvard Kennedy School, that the internet gives you an illusion. Like, you know, many of us use social media, Instagram, and sometimes you get, oh, like, look at it. I got this many likes. How wonderful. Mm -hmm. And you live with that uh, personified image of yourself. And the same goes to digital advocacy. Sometimes I feel like, oh, look at my Twitter. It got um, retweeted a thousand times, and it got viewed, like, 100k or maybe everybody is listening to me but there's a fallacy in that and it's very important that you still need to visit members of congress um no for example one thing we do is that we bring these survivors of the concentration camps, many Uyghur rights-based organizations they use storytelling and testify before congress to explain what's happening to the impacted communities. Without those kind of traditional advocacy, mm -hmm. digital advocacy alone won't achieve the desired outcome that you're achieving. One recent example that I can give is that, I think perhaps many of you know this, uh, Gary Kasparov, who is a very famous uh, chess player, a uh, Russian dissident. Um, Gary is known, and, and I think I have uh, tremendous respect for him, uh, and he has massive followers on Twitter, uh, I have no idea how many. Um, recently, he'd been just talking a lot about Russia, Ukraine, and uh, Russia's aggression and so forth. And Elon Musk had a feud with him, uh, given uh, apparently he thinks he has done so much more for the Ukrainians by activating Starlink. I have a lot of criticism against Elon Musk um, in terms of his support for authoritarian countries like China, where he has massive business and has. Um, his uh, buying Twitter raises a global huge concern for me. And he said, what did you do, Gary Kasper, other than tweeting about things? <laughs> um, and to which I think a lot of journalists did highlight that Gary Kasper is like one of the protesters early in Russia. That's one of the reasons he was a dissident and now living in, in exile and trying to raise awareness on, on social issues and especially concerning right now Ukraine and Russia's aggression. <clears throat> so so I think that um, and, and I think another issue that I really want to highlight is that I think you've talked about a bit but the different kinds of political actors emerge in this space we call it digital advocacy. And while I, for them, I wouldn't call it digital advocacy, it is a digital space that it, they are utilizing. And these are authoritarian leaders. Give you an example, uh, many countries, uh, authoritarian countries, and China is a great example of that, um, stifles dis dissent at home. They don't allow their citizens to use spaces like Twitter, for example, Instagram, Facebook, but they're very much active on Twitter, Facebook, and and social media. So we talked about the power of using hashtag. For example, free Uyghurs is one of the, the hashtag to, to raise awareness on this issue. But then these state officials, they have different kinds of hashtag. It's called happy Uyghurs. Mm -hmm. And the disinformation they engage is that these are Western lies. Uyghurs are living happily. Like, you know, and they, they try to use these propaganda images and videos to transmit a different kind of message. So that's the kind of environment we're living in in digital space. You have this powerful sta states that galvanize their bots um, and their millions of users to engage in, in a massive disinformation. And you are just left with like an individual or activist or, um, and it's kind of like your, your tools and resources are much more limited in comparison. Which is a little bit what, like Louisa was saying, that need for then upskilling advocacy organizations, the traditional ones, that actually be able to use some of those tools because they're very uneven. Yeah. Nina, you know, we've got a lot of issues on the table now. Um, I've got one question online from Luke. There's questions in the audience. Who's got questions here? Okay, great. So, can I suggest, should we open up a little bit? 
Um, I mean, read out Luke's question because I think it gets at quite a lot of what we've been talking about. And perhaps um, we'll take one more and then we'll get you guys to have a quick response and then we'll come round because I can see there's a lot of hands. So, um, and Luke's question is, Nina, did you speak to any politicians, or sorry, policymakers, to understand how they consider the importance of such campaigns? I've spoken to multiple MPs in Australia who say that they entirely ignore mass petitions or copy and paste emails. Um, so just the, the efficacy. So perhaps if you'd like to come back on that, you've got Louise's question about to what extent they have the skills and are able to play in this unlevel playing field. Let's take one more. Yes, gentlemen in the front here. And I promise you, I know there's other questions. We'll come back. Yes, please. From the African Studies Center at Oxford University. How would you categorize the mob action that uh, Donald Trump was able to mobilize on January 6th on the US Capitol? How would you categorize? I've seen all your categories, you know. I was able to mass mobilize uh, that action on the capital here. Thank you. Whether it fits into this exactly same framework, because she's looked at, you very looked, actually looked at the kind of progressive left, and that was a very different set of politics, but was it a similar model, I guess? It's an interesting question. Nina, do you want to come back first and then yeah, sure. on those, and then we'll pick some more? Great. Great questions. Thanks all, and thanks to the two discussants. Um, so maybe Luke's question first, because I think you're right, Luke, and thanks for raising it, to point to the limitations of online petitions. There's, you know, tactical fatigue. David Karp's also written about this. Others have written about this. Um, yeah, sure, online petitions at first were novel and people paid attention to them, but I've had numerous examples and I have spoken with, you know, people who've said, you just change email addresses. You go to, a, if you're a decision maker and you're getting spam, you change to a personal email address or similar um with you know in the uh, there was a phase where it was faxes people would fax and things and that's precisely why i don't fo focus on evaluating tactics the point of the book isn't to say online petitions are better or worse it's not to say social movements on twitter are better or worse it's to ask about the organizations and how they evolve and reflect on the tactics that they choose so that some of them do use online petitions and you know rightly you can critique it when it doesn't work I, I don't have any invested you know interest in suggesting one tactic's always right or wrong what what i'm curious about is how these groups also have grown as new technologies have emerged because when move on was established in 998 right so this is pre-facebook now they've all learned um and used frequently say facebook video to try and get their members and supporters to share personal stories, the effect of personal storytelling. And interestingly, they do do things, um, just building on one of, I think it was Rashan asking about the role of more insider forms of lobbying and advocacy, going and meeting Congress people. Sometimes these organizations work with and prepare, uh, say, welfare beneficiaries to go and speak uh, in front of um, select committees. I know a group, the group in New Zealand Action Station has done that. Um, so there's a whole range of tactics they can use. And I would, you know, rightly, let's study them, figure out what works. But for me, the question is then, what do you, you know, how do you evolve and develop as an organization? You know, um, on this, on the, and then on this question then of just the type of tools they're using and to what extent, so you've got, you've got um, marketing companies with very sophisticated data yeah. analytics. Are they able to keep up with and use similar tactics? So there's a real range across the groups. And this gets to your question, um, Louisa, about... To what extent are they really doing analytic activism? Now, I should note the big groups are able to do it better than the smaller ones, right? Partly because they have bigger members and you need a certain number of members to be able to do those kinds of studies. You know, people who you know, do quantitative know you, you need a large membership size, but also you need some money and funding and staff expertise. And they have in-house analytics teams. Milan de Freyes was actually uh, one of the discussants. He's now... Um, he was Move On's director of digital analytics. They had a whole team doing it. Same with 38 Degrees. They have tech staff. And that, if anything, I sort of highlight that they don't have expertise on issues, but they do have expertise. It's in tech. It's in setting up platforms. And they work closely with um, others in the private sector, um, somebody called Nathan Woodhull, who's helped support these groups, for instance, to use um, Control Shift Labs, which is enabling them to host petitions where anyone, anyone in this room can go and start their own campaign. But that sounds obvious and easy to do, but you have to set up the back end to be able to help people to do that. And interestingly, other NGOs are now emulating and copying these sorts of things. So there's a whole lot to explore, and maybe this will come up later, about the relationship between these digital advocacy organizations and their impact um, on other organizations like Oxfam, like Greenpeace, and whether or not there's sort of cooperation, uh, competition, or emulation. Um, and, and then to your question, Sonny, great, great question. 
Um, I'm not an expert on the far right. And in fact, I often get asked the question when I present this, this is all very nice about progressive groups, but what's, what is the right doing, right? Like what, what are right wing actors or far right? Um, and in fact, in order to answer that question, I've um, teamed up with a couple of researchers at the German Internet Institute, the Weizenbaum, and we ask a much smaller question than, you know, what you're sort of asking about the entire landscape of the right and how it fits into different kinds of organizing, which is an important question. Um, and we ask, are there examples of copycats? Groups that have specifically said, we see the power of move on in the US and we want to create a right wing move on, or we see the power of get up and we want to create, and there are, and we find a handful of them. But interestingly, um, those organizations that we identify aren't as powerful or successful as their other right-wing counterparts, Breitbart or Tea Party, or, you know, there are multiple different forms. So I think that's one thing is to think about the different forms of organization, be it social movement, be it alt media, um, and also the way that they've emulated Move On, Get Up, Camp Act, um, is to be multi-issue, is to be rapid response, but not so much to hand over power to members to drive the campaigning. And what I mean there is they don't, for instance, on their websites have distributed petitions where any member can set it up. And from what we can see, and I haven't done the ethnographic study, right? So this is one smaller research paper. I just want to qualify. It's not five years of ethnographic work like I've done um, with these other groups. But what we can see on the websites is that it seems that it's more top down and more hierarchical. And, and I want to point out there that there's research, very good research by Jen Trady, who's compared the left and the right organizing and actually argued the right is better online because they're hierarchical, because they have more resources, because there's a division of labor. And this argument that grassroots movements without, you know, horizontal networks will be more effective, she really challenges that. And I think there's, there's good reason to challenge that. It's a little bit like your point about authoritarian regimes being actually able to sort of counter and be very sophisticated in how they're using social media as well. So they're sort of they're out there as well. There's a multiple, multitude of actors. Let's get some other, let's pick three comments coming. Okay. Five hands up. Can we do all five? Should we go yeah, through all five? It'd be lovely to hear from more voices. Yeah, great. So let's, yeah, pass with the hat. Yeah. Um, so building on this point about the far right and, and your point, um, you know, it, as, a, as a new tool and platform, there is potential for it to be used by them. And I wonder if you think, you said you're working with the German Institute on this issue. Um, do you see any scope for regulations of these digital adv advocacy groups? Um, you mentioned NGOs, which are a strong um, advocacy, you know, stakeholder, um, and they have regulations. So I don't know. Perhaps that's something we, that we could advocate for at regulations on these groups. Have you got a thought about what that regulation might look like? What do you? What, what aspects of them would you want to be regulated? Um, well, it's hard to say, isn't it? Because the digital um, platform and online is really a tool mm -hmm. that can be used by anyone. And so that makes it very problematic. But maybe we can look to Facebook and Twitter as examples. Mm -hmm. um, Twitter, Twitter regulates, you know, hate, hate speech and mm -hmm. things like that. Mm -hmm. So maybe lessons can be learned from there. Mm -hmm. I've got to ask everyone to introduce themselves. Oh, um, I'm Alice Abbott. I'm working at doing a DPhil on climate uh, policy and ethics. Brilliant. Great, great point. Please introduce yourself. Uh, hi, I'm Ren. I'm doing the MSc in public policy research uh, here at Monarch School. I did MPP in 2015. Um, uh, so I've been working in the past 10 years in sort of the NGO sphere in, in Malaysia, and mm -hmm. I work in a maybe what you would call a more traditional NGO. We were like 40 years old. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, but so, so, but we do have these organizations are popping up in working in the Malaysia space as well. So, like Change.org, for example, mm -hmm. uh, just last year hired a uh, open a Malaysia office. I think that's the first one that we, that we've had. Um, and, and I'm just wondering because in this and sort of building off of Rehan's point as well on sort of the value of, I guess, convention conventional mm -hmm. advocacy, and <clears throat> that's certainly been my experience where. We do a lot of conventional advocacy. We've worked on issues like you know, making stocking an offense, critical maternity leave, improving domestic violence laws. And you know, we've had some success. Uh, and we've had actually in interacted with, with these uh, kinds of groups, uh, not really transnational issues, but I guess they, they are digital advocacy organizations. And so in, in very important touch points, we've worked together with, say, Change the Org or some other organization mm -hmm. to, you know, as part of a larger campaign, you know, put out a huge petition and then go to, go to the parliament and say, hey, look, 50,000 people signed our petition or like, you know, 
delivering a petition to some minister saying, look, 10,000 people signed this, this, this thing. And so I'm wondering whether you, you kind of looked at that sort of collaboration, whether that, that's happening at all between the, the more, yeah, the more sort of traditional um, um, NGOs with this, this digital so then it's sustained to the, from the point of view of 38 degrees, it might be a one-off, but actually it's a part of a much wider, longer term systemic change. Okay, I want to go sweeping around the room this way. So let's keep, yes, please. Uh, for these digital advocacy groups, do you find that they're more issue amplifying or are they like agenda setting? Uh, mm. Yeah. And you're to introduce yourself. Oh, sorry. I'm James. I'm an MVP at Blavatek right now. So it, issue amplifying or agenda setting? Nicely framed. Let's keep going. Rounds. Yes, please. <clears throat> yes, my name is Anka Aslam. I'm the faculty of the Hattie School where you know used to work. So and where this research started. So thank you. <laughs> so I, I, want to, I, I want to come back to the effectiveness because I, I do think that's mm -hmm. an important issue. Because if we, you know, if we came to the or if, if you came to the conclusion this actually does has very little impact. And the question is really so what, you know. Mm -hmm. And and when we talk about impact, I think we can talk about impact in, in terms of advocacy and sort of how does it reach policy making and political decisions. But we can also think of impact in the sense of innovation in terms of advocacy. Maybe these groups have zero impact when it comes to the real decision making, but maybe they have a lot of impact when it comes to how other NGOs and maybe traditional NGOs sort of start adjusting to the digital age. Maybe that is what their role is. They're just sort of innovation breeders but not really important for what's going on in real decision making. It's just that. So we reframing what we think about as impact and actually how they're having an impact. Yeah, great, please. Uh, thanks, Ralph Chaudhry, Oxford Internet Institute. Uh, I want to dig deeper into this analytics business because in marketing or in newspapers, you can't really get into those organizations and ask them, you know, how are you using analytics and yeah. where's the real and to come back to the previous question, impact. I mean, so the question is, do these companies kind of use analytics to really measure their visibility and their impact in social media? And do they use those analytics to really improve, you know, to get more bang for their buck, if you want to call it that, the next time around that they have a campaign? You know, do they use that systematically and, and through their analytics? <laughs> Great. So, you know, let's come back to you, and then I'm going to come back to Louisa and Graham on any of these questions as well that you guys want to add in. Fantastic. Great set of questions. Um, I might go through them chronologically. Regulation. Uh, yes, many of them already are regulated because being, you know, they are registered somehow, either as not-for-profits or as um, sometimes they have political action committees. So Move On has a political action committee that allows it to engage in in campaigning um, in the European context, well, the global context, GDPR around privacy. That was a really big shock for many of these organizations because suddenly you'd sign, you know, they had taken people's emails and assumed they could keep contacting them. And GDPR meant they had to request if those people would stay on. And a lot of them lost members at that point. So there are already regulations. Um, there are also changes that have happened. And Anka probably knows a little bit, um, probably more than I do, about the German uh, case where the German government changed uh, the, the tax status of ATTACK and also CAMPACT um, because they were seen to be too political. Mm -hmm. um, and so they actually lost their charity status. And interestingly, Get Up in Australia has also been um, faced a lot of scrutiny from uh, both the Senate and from other um, members of parliament. And they have been criticized for accepting foreign funding and seen as stooges of, you know, uh, even smeared with with the sort of Soros smear. Um, and actually, I know uh, one individual who was living in New Zealand giving Get Up money, and he had got all his money back because Get Up had to refund all the foreign funding that they had, even from a random New Zealander giving, you know, whatever, $5 a month or something. So they do have regulation. I think the bigger question you ask, which is an important one, is like, how do we regulate the digital space? And what is the relationship between them who are also operating on Facebook, operating on Twitter? Are they complicit? Are they trying to change the rules of the game? Because it's a sort of messy world. They're, they're operating in this world that many of them would be critical of. And there are some examples that I could point to where they are trying to, particularly um, the, the German case of Campact has been quite active around um, 
digital hate speech, as has the group in New Zealand Action Station. But yeah, for sure, there's lots more to be asked around regulation in the digital space. Um, so these two questions from, thanks, Ren, for that really specific example. It's a really great one. And from James, I think, sit together really well. Because the groups are not agenda centres. They do not see their role as picking up issues that are off the political uh, agenda that aren't already important. They see their role as coming in when the issue is already in the mainstream debate, like the example of the refugees debate, um, and then being like the cavalry and swooping in and providing support for groups like Ren Yours, whether you might have a really specific issue that has a very small membership, but you can see an important debate in parliaments coming up or a referendum or an important international meeting and trying to push uh, the decision across the line. So in a way that the way they conceive of their impact, coming to Anka's question, is in that uh, very moment of issue amplifying. Um, and in fact, the book does look at some examples of this. Um, I think a lot more could be done by others to do research on this. But when I, if I'm to honestly answer when I think they're effective in terms of political outcomes, and this is Anka's question, I think it's when they do partner with issue-specific organizations and work to amplify the messages coming from those issue-specific organizations. So an example, for instance, in New Zealand, there was a, a campaign to double New Zealand's refugee quota. It's extremely small. It might surprise New Zealand's refugee quota was like 750 per year refugees, smaller than Australia's. Um, and a, a guy, one person, Murdoch Stevens, and he's written a book about it, so I could even I quote his book, reflecting on him, and he says he couldn't, you know, he had a couple of other volunteers get very far on his own. He had exactly the same problem that you had, Red, of saying, we want to get lots of people involved, but we're so specific. And so he went to Action Station, the New Zealand equivalent, and they helped him magnify it. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying that, you know, Action Station was the result, you know, resulted in his win. He also did an extremely hard, long campaign of insider advocacy. But the point I'm trying to make is that they can be effective. It doesn't always work mm -hmm. if when those sorts of partnerships evolve. And if anything, what I want would encourage people working in the space to reflect on is the sort of ecology of actors, the relationship between groups that are really good at doing insider and other groups that are good at doing mobilizing. And, you know, scholars would argue there's also a role in um, organizing people, not just mobilizing, but this is sort of a superficial level. This is Hari Han's work, um, great work on um, how organizations develop activists. And she looks at the deeper organizing work. And coming, so to your question, Anka, I, I think they do at times help shape political outcomes. I think there is variation. So to give you the exact example, I think Campact, um, contributed to a high politicization around TTIP in the German case. And others have pointed to that. You know, why was there so much politicization in Germany around TTIP and not in France or Italy? And Campat was particularly strong. Also helped to um, support groups in Sweden and other groups across Europe on trade. But they weren't very successful on JEFTA or on Mercosur. So subsequently, members' interests dropped off and they found it hard to push. So I wouldn't say CAMPAC's always successful on trade. And other issues, CAMPAC hasn't been as successful on refugee rights. In Germany, it was much more complicated campaigning on refugee rights because it was the people on, you know, the sort of opposition uh, on the right that you were campaigning, not the government, at least initially. Mm -hmm. um, so it is issue-specific, you know, country-specific and, and time-specific. Um, I think GetUp's been really successful working with others in the refugee sector on refugee rights. It's contributed also on climate. Um, but I do think an important element of the book is exactly that, the ripple effect as other organisations look to these. And I've been at Oxfam uh, meetings where uh, senior campaigners at Oxfam have said, we're losing our best campaigners to these groups. And what are they doing that we aren't? And, and get a, a, sorry, Greenpeace, for instance, saw this power and actually tried to, under Kumi Naidoo's leadership after the Copenhagen summit in 2009, also follow some of these ideas. So I think there is a ripple effect. But I would note, I don't think we're about to see any of the mainstream organizations turn into these. I think there'll be a sort of imitations of particular tactics, but we're not going to see a total transformation. Um, and we can come back to talk about why. And thanks, um, Ralph. Great to have you here from, um, yeah, Oxford Internet Institute. And, and yes, they are collecting um, a lot of digital analytics. Um, and it is informing their campaigning decisions. So what does that mean? It means that, for instance, 38 Degrees um, will look at which emails are most successful on a given day or a given week. It could be that they send out to a small sample size uh, test campaign um, and then 
based on that, decide whether or not to go ahead with a campaign. They talk about every email as a survey and groups have the sort of rhetoric that we sometimes associate with Facebook, you know, it, that they want, um, they want to try and, you know, sort of fast and furious. And if it fails, that's fine. You know, if it doesn't work out. Um, I didn't get access to all of their analytics data, but I did get access to see how they think about, like the sort of dashboards that they think about. So members returning to action is an incredibly important metric for them. How often do members come back? It's not just about, another one is members growth. So the, the crude number of members, but also um, how often those members that they've got on one campaign then come back for, for subsequent um, ones. So yeah, happy to talk more and, and curious about your reflections on how that compares to, to the media to the media sector. Great. And then just to wrap up, I'm gonna ask Louisa Rehan one short, sharp sort of reflection or thought from the questions, any comments you want to have. And then Nina, my last question for you is just to share where's the research going next? What's the next it's plan? So just to round us off. So please, Louisa. <clears throat> yeah, uh, two things. Uh, first on the on the question on regulation. Um I'll just add one thing, and is that since many of the activities that these organizations re, uh, that, uh, depend on one, what they post, so we're talking about regulating speech, basically. And regulating speech is a very tricky business, especially mm -hmm. when it comes to hate speech, because it's very, I mean, this could be a whole uh, talk on this, but it's very difficult to draw the line. So just to give you an example, like where you draw the line, what is hate speech and what isn't. So just to give you an example, Black Lives Matter has been, uh, um, so, so, some people claim that Black Lives Matter is hate speech. It's a hate speech movement. And on the, um, on the analytics, just, well, this would be also a, a further question that we won't, maybe, maybe later, but, um, I'm very interest, interested in this thing that you just mentioned about how they are so interested on measuring the number of members. Because mm -hmm. I do know that one of the things that they could be look, looking into uh, with the analytics is, for example, how much they are reaching people who are like farther from their view. So like how, so yeah. you, can, you, can, you can see, for example, if you're doing social media research, how polarized a conversation is. And I, one measure of success could be how much they're getting people from here to come to speak with people from over here, how much they're convincing these people. But maybe that's not what they're looking into and more like just our members, like these people from this side that we want to like open that base. So that, that, that sounds very interesting. It's a seminar on uh, anal yeah. data analytics for social yes. for public policy yeah. and campaigning coming up. Rayhan. Uh, quoting from um, uh, one of the, um, I believe, Google employee featured in the very famous uh, documentary on Netflix called The Social Media Network. If you haven't watched it, please do watch. Um, Tristan Harris. I think the important thing that we need to think about is how do you make technology humane? And in relation to the topic about you know, how do we tackle issues concerning disinformation in the digital space? Technology should serve to advance human rights, not to actually aid and abet repression. That is something I deeply am concerned about. So in that respect, Twitter did something very tiny, very simple, which is labeling the accounts. If you look at it, Russian media affiliated account, Russian state affiliated account, you know we are the source of information that you're receiving from. Like China, it's the same thing. But YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, they don't do that. So you may be left with an information that actually came from the state to engage in propaganda. So like something that simple um, can be done. But you know, in America, people always talk about free speech. And I think, but I think we still need to debate the issue of can a private media company like Twitter can completely um, you know, in some ways stifle the president of the United States, right? Like, it, should that power be left with a social media company, a private company? You know, and I think those are very important discussions that we need to have to strengthen our democracy. And in terms of last comment on effectiveness, I think when I often look at Hong Kong democracy movement, like I, I think the, the massive protesters, like really just the on the street, like actually asking for solidarity of the global community. Those moments still have much larger effect 
on us as individuals because we see people's aspiration for democracy. So I absolutely agree with your conclusion that digital advocacy alone is not going to achieve um, um, or I think advance human rights moment. I think we really need to do the grassroots organizing. We still need to do the protests. We still need to show up every day and ultimately, hopefully, to achieve a, a better world. Thank you. And you know where? Yeah, wow. Um, thanks for hosting me. Um, I have a couple of quick comments if I can make them. I just want to acknowledge that digital surveillance is a really big issue. And one limitation of the book is it's not talking about advocacy in authoritarian contexts. So really credit to all of the work that you're doing and to others working in really difficult conditions. Um, and I think the analytics component is, like you pointed out rightly, there's a lot more that they're doing that I haven't given life to in this talk. So read the book. And where to next? Um, I am thinking more about climate activism, working with a colleague at Cambridge, Mete Arstrup Sandovani, who's also got a great book out, uh, Direct Enforcement, about the roles that uh, NGOs are using, say, satellite or um, other data to do environmental campaigning. So continue to work around climate activism and have a few other projects, but would love to chat with you all and hear about your work too. And thanks for hosting me. Uh, just want to give a shout out, especially if there are people watching online. Is they, I think one thing that we really need to watch for right now is the Iranian people's aspiration for democracy. We saw massive protesters um, and that's something that we need to join. It's a moment that, Really are inspiring. Thank you. Thank you for reminding us of digital advocacy. <laughs> <laughs> Huge thanks to Nina, to both of you for being discussing for all these events. I look forward to continuing the conversation. Thank you all. Thanks. So much. <laughs>